time you didn't even have that camera weren't it, did you? <laughs> I'll buy time while she's getting the camera actually working. Uh, thank you so much uh, for everyone that came forward and did something last weekend as part of... that time off uh, Sunday, what would have happened is what we'd normally do uh, during that weekend, and that is I come home Saturday, uh, I do both churches, and then would turn around and drive back to Bowling Green again Sunday afternoon just to turn around and watch usually the finals match and then turn around and drive home. Um, that didn't happen. They weren't in the finals this year, so if I would not have been there Sunday morning, I would not have seen probably the best soccer match that him and that team has played in three or four years. So uh, it was appropriate, it was perfect, and it's what it was supposed to be. So thank you for all of you that, that stepped forward and did something. Um, I've, we've talked about it in our worship committee. Uh, we want more uh, proactiveness up here. We want more of you involved. So we're looking for a lay leader, somebody that comes up, does the call to worship, reads the Psalms, uh, would then even read the scripture and then turn it over, right? So we're looking for people to be that, to get involved in that way. So if that's something that God's speaking to you and pulling onto your heart, let me know if you'd be ready to do that next Sunday, okay? You can do that, good. I was just get, killing time for you. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we'll switch that patch out. Good morning. When Nancy asked if I'd share my go-to Bible verse story, I told her that I really didn't have a story because this is the very first verse that I remember memorizing when I was a child. To which she replied, well, that still makes it special or something to that effect. I think I remember it as being my first because for a five-year-old, six-year-old, Philippians is just a fun word to say. <laughs> um, yeah, my Bible verse is Philippians 4.4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Um, then things kept having happening. Uh, one Friday night, I was in the office working, and I looked at the calendar on the wall to see something. And the header is Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord for April. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Then when corner... Er, Cornerstone, we're Cornerstone. New Beginnings changed their sign for Easter. The one side is rejoice in the Lord always. So I said, okay, God, I get it. I'm supposed to give my story this month. So here I am. And with that, I would like to say there's another phrase in the Bible that's there multiple times. Fear not, do not be afraid. So when Nancy asks you to give your story, do not be afraid, whatever it is, however it affects your life, we want to hear about it. This Bible verse has been a mainstay in my life, and I didn't guess I really didn't realize it. People always talk about when they first became a Christian or they first knew Jesus, and I try to think of that, but I really don't have one of those moments because I grew up in my home Methodist church in St. Mary's, and as a child, I was taken to church every Sunday, but I don't think I looked at it as having to go. I wanted to go. Um, and I think back then it was even for the fellowship, the fun and the friends and the lessons. I had junior church, Sunday school, um, MYF, and youth camps. Um, my parents were involved in the church, both in business and in the groups which also meant I was involved. I was the youngest. They didn't have anybody to take care of me, so I got drug along to a lot of places. Um, for example, um, the year I was born, my mom won a prize for having the youngest daughter at the mother-daughter banquet. I was four months old. Um, when I was older, I was seven, my mom was going to be a camp counselor for my sister at Camp Wesley. 
And again, there was nobody to take care of me, so she got special permission to take me along. So that was my first experience at Camp Wesley, and luckily, every summer when I was able to go and be a camp kid, um, that was my camp of choice, and I loved it. I remember um, Vesper Hill, always wanted to get married there, but it didn't happen. So, um, then when I got older, was Lakeside, and we have lots of special memories there, if any of you have ever been to Lakeside. Um, oh, I lost my place, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, also, when I was younger, we camped, and when we would go places when I was little, we'd stop at church, we'd go to church on Sunday, so I could get a bulletin, take it back to Sunday school, because do any of you remember the pins? Yeah, I had to get my perfect attendance pin at the end of the year, so I would always take a bulletin back. And then well, we were also in a camping club, and the, we would take over the church service, and sometimes the kids would be involved. And my dad always hated it and was upset when I gave the message because I'd get emotional and cry. I see now that that's not a bad thing. Thank you, Pastor Mike. <laughs> so, Dad, just suck it up up there. It's a good thing. Then in my high school years, it was off to Lakeside, and oh, the memories and experiences there. One year, a group of us was walking down along the, the lake and the shore, and the lightning bugs were just dancing over the water, and it was just an awesome experience. So awesome that one of the pastors was out in the lake baptizing people, of which I ended up being one, and he was Reverend Joe Tripp from Westminster, Ohio, and I will never forget that. Um, I did lose my way for a while after I got married, um, but then Dick and I started to try out other churches in the area, and one year we were going to Stony Creek when Reverend Lundy was there. I don't know if any of you remember Floyd Lundy, but he was there, and Dick decided he wanted to be baptized in Stony Creek on a friend's farm, but only if I would do it too. So, yes, I was baptized again. I think I've been baptized three times in my life. Once, once as a baby, and two of my choice. Um, I was ev eventually brought back to this church, well, the old church, during Pastor, Ju Pastor Julia's time here, when she reached out to me, and as they say, the rest is history. This Bible verse has always crept into my mind at different times. There are other verses that are special to me too, but when I think about it, this verse is my life. I will rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. That's yours. See, it's really not very hard. And it's really good, right? You, you learn a lot about people, right? Totally fits, right? Totally fits. Uh, this morning, we're going to share the reading of Psalms as we prepare our hearts for worship. And it's one that you, you probably know, and it's one that's normal, but I want you to hear it in that shepherd and sheep mindset that we're trying to set for today's text. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength, guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect me and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. 
It's a little different when you start thinking of yourself as the sheep in that picture, right? We come to our time of praying together. Uh, friends who are joining us online, we are glad you're here, glad you're taking part in this. Uh, pray that you would put your prayer requests in the comment section. If you want to just put no comment or prayer request or request or blank something uh, that will alert us that you will have a request or you would like to be prayed for, we can do that. Uh, you're going to go quiet here for a minute as we talk in-house, and then we'll come back and join together for uh, group prayer.
loving and gracious God, you have continued to speak and to be a part of the lives of your people, people that choose to see you and hear you and don't always have it all together. And yet here you are in the midst of your broken people still providing a way, still providing a way to connect and to be in relationship. In the moment you created us, you wanted this creation to be different and to stand out and to be in your likeness. And so we were meant to be in that relationship with you. Over time, you tried to rectify that situation and to work it and, and make it work. And as you went along, you realized that Jesus, your son, would have to come and be one of us, to be like us, to teach us, and to guide us, and then to sacrifice his life in our place. That was going to be the one way that we would receive true atonement for our sin, to be forgiven, and to have an opportunity at this relationship. And throughout our lives, God, we've not always been the greatest at listening to your voice. We want to be the voice that speaks a lot, and yet it's only because of your son Jesus that we even have a right to speak to you. And sometimes, God, we need to be quiet and listen at times, and we need to hear your voice. But because of Jesus, not because of our works or our things, you've been listening to us this morning. You listen to us all the time, but you've heard us as we've been speaking. We know that there are those who are on a healing path and they are getting better, that there are groups that are meeting that are fulfilling your presence and your purpose within it, that there are kids traveling home and we pray that they are safe. And there are many that we have talked about this morning that have cancer. And God, you know each one of the names that we've mentioned about cancer. And God, I wanna pray that first and foremost, you heal their heart and their spirit that their spirit and their eternity is far more valuable and important than their temporary shell of a body. But if it be your will, as Jesus said, heal their body, give them more time, give them the ability to be with their family and relationships and their friends more. God, you know that there are uh, a million things that we've talked about and asked about, and God, we pray that you would take this moment of silence and you would allow us to express ourselves to you directly one-on-one, -on -one. conviction, hope, joy, and hurt, all of that expressed to you directly. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. Hear those words. Hear those thoughts. Hear the confessions. Hear the repentance. Hear the souls longing to be set free. Hear the, the voice of those looking for healing. Hear the voice of men and women who are trying their best and give them strength and let them be renewed. Let us feel your presence here in this moment that this is a place and this is a peace that you cannot receive from outside of here, outside of uh, your connection. This is where we find our hope. This is where we find our freedom. This is where we find our goodness. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus taught us that we should love one another. And in doing such, we are showing each other what God looks like, and he would know. And so this Jesus taught us not only that we would continue to meet, that we would continue to be together in relationship, but that we would gather together and we would pray this prayer that he taught us to gather together and pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, church. I like praying together. I think that's good stuff. If you are able to stand and for the reading of scripture, uh, if you're at home, you can read along, you can read your own Bible. I pray that you'd get your Bibles out and turn to John chapter 10. Uh, This morning, uh, I'm going to cover a lot of ground, but we're going to just take this text and, and piece it together. John chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant, so he explained it to them. I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and find good pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. This is God's word for God's people. You may be seated. So how was it having a week off? For me, I mean, you didn't, you got, you got to get a week for, away from me. Good? It's good to hear somebody else teach, right? Especially when you, it kind of jives. <laughs> it makes it even better, right? <laughs> Makes us feel like, it makes somebody like me feel like, okay, I'm not going crazy. This is, this is what he's saying too, okay. Well, I hope, I, I noticed, uh, I loved Dr. Shivington, and I pray that he's uh, always available because <laughs> I might need him again in July. Um, but uh, hopeful and thoughtful uh, that he really brought you something, and he brought you some goodness, and he brought you some solid teaching scripturally uh, and hopefully uh, he totally forgot to give you the five things, though. Right? I should have warned him about that. Hey, we, we got re- to make sure we're talking about the five things that we're supposed to be remembering, the things that are helping us, right? How was your surrender this week? That's a hard one. It's hard to surrender to what God's trying to do with and through you. Uh, how was your surrounded? Don't be afraid to be around people. Other people can lift you up and can help you. I'm going to talk about that here in a minute. How was the Spirit leading you? Let the Spirit lead sometimes. It's hard. It's not always easy. Were you self-fed? Right? Dig into Scripture. Find out what God's trying to say. And then how did you take all of that and go? What did you teach other people? How did you help other people? Where were you sent? He's always sending us, right? Well, I appreciate that and and appreciate what uh, Pastor Shivington did. And I'm glad that you guys got fed. Because that's, that's a good place to be, right? Being able to take part in, in family and, and do things and not neglect them. Uh, if I neglect them, that's going to really f- affect everybody. So hopefully I'm not doing that too often. Hopefully we've been talking about since Easter what happens now that Jesus is alive forever. <laughs> Easter, we often associate Easter with a day. Right? It's someday in April, maybe March, depending upon the year, 
right? That's how the calendar falls. But we say, oh, that's the day we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You can do that every day. You don't need a, you don't need a day in spring to celebrate resurrection because, oh, man, he's still alive. He's still not in the grave. He is still not dead. He is still alive. We don't have to wait on that. So what does our life look like? Jesus is risen. What do we look like? Last week, Dr. Shivington gave us uh, information on how the church should look, right? Good behavior, sound doctrine, sound behavior, what we should be doing. Today, we find out how to do this as his sheep What Jesus gives us in today's text is an illustration of our daily life now that he's alive. See, we thought it was about something else, and really it's just about a continuation of life, constantly living and being there. In order to understand what he's saying today, you have to go back and find out what he's talking about. Go back to chapter 9. Now, it wasn't that long ago we talked about chapter 9. We talked about it when we talked about spiritual blindness, right? Needing sight. There's a young man who's born without sight. His parents testified to that. Jesus sees him, says, you want to see? Okay. Takes some dirt, spits in it a little bit, makes a little paste, puts it on his eyes. Says, okay, now go wash it off. Unfortunately, all this is happening on the Sabbath. All right? If it would have happened any day but the Sabbath, well, we wouldn't be talking about it. So it happens on the Sabbath, the guy goes over, washes his eyes, boom, he can see. Oh my goodness, I can see. And Jesus says, well, go to the Pharisees, uh, let them prove you as being clean and can see. And, and, and that way, you'll, that's the way it worked. That was the order of things that had to happen. Unfortunately, he goes to the Pharisees and everybody's too busy worried about, A, uh, he, Jesus, is healing in the name of God and he's doing it on the Sabbath. How in the world could this evil sinner be giving sight to this kid? Well, the parents agreed that it wasn't about whether or not he was a sinner because surely a sinner wouldn't be able to heal his sight. He was born blind. That doesn't just happen. The young man, though convinced and stirred and moved, Beat up, if you will. They're trying to tell him he's not the Messiah. He's not him. He's not the guy. He's just a bad man who can play some parlor tricks. I don't know how those, those magic tricks you're talking about, I don't know how they made it to, to give insight to blind people, but I don't know that that's how that works. In chapter 10, we are left with what has happened since. Now, you know the story. He goes back to Jesus because he is not hearing the voice of the shepherd and he's wondering who that shepherd is. Now, we're talking about a span of a few days. We're not talking about decades, right? We're not talking about 10 years later, he goes and search for Jesus. No, he literally like goes there. They have this interaction. I'm talking Within the same week, he's out, he's back trying to find Jesus, the one that gave him sight. And when he gets there, look at what the world, look at what the Pharisees, the thieves and robbers did to his mentality and what he viewed Jesus as. He gets to Jesus and Jesus says to him, do you believe in the son of man? And the man answered, who is he, sir? He doesn't even recognize the savior that just healed his eyes because of what he's been through. Let that sink in the next time you're watching too much news, right? I want to believe in him, he says. And Jesus says, you have seen him and he is speaking to you. He says, yes, Lord, I believe. And the man worshiped Jesus. Now this is the microcosm of then what Jesus starts saying about this moment. Y'all are listening to the wrong shepherd. That's basically where he starts. I was doing a lot of reading and and for class, I've been into a lot of Francis Asbury commentary lately. And I caught this glimpse of this text. 
it's a little bit out there. You got to realize, you know, it's, it's old. <laughs> it didn't, we didn't speak and write like we did now. Francis Asbury put it, false shepherds are deceitful, both in their manner of access to the fold and in their intention toward the sheep. Access to the fold, intentions toward the sheep are never going to be what they should be. Got a lot of that going on in the world right now. But the authentic shepherd is known to both the watchman, the Holy Spirit, who admits him to the fold, opens the gate, and the sheep who listen to his voice and go through the gate. The man that was born blind, he knew who the real shepherd was. He knew that that man unlocked his eyes and no one had ever been able to do that before in the history of the world. This was an impossible feat. He knew that there was something different about this person who came and healed his eyes and let him see. However, he goes back to be confirmed, if you will, by the world. As the authorities say, this is how this has to happen. You've got to go to the Pharisees. They'll say you're clean. They'll say, oh, you have a miracle and you can see now. This is great. Instead, when he arrives, he finds that the thieves and robbers are the ones that are there. And they are more interested in the way that he healed his sight and the how day, obviously, what day of the week it was, and who he was claiming to be, rather than proving that he was right. And as they spend time breaking him down, breaking him down, breaking him down, he's now left with these choices to make. We already saw that when he went back to Jesus, he didn't really recognize him. That's what the world does to us. It breaks us apart. It makes us see all the temporary pleasures as something fruitful, something we should search for, yearn for, something we should strive to achieve. When in the end, all it's going to do is just bring us more hurt. It's going to leave us feeling empty, and we're going to miss the gate. We're trying to walk through the wrong gate all the time. <laughs> How many of you remember the show, uh, Let's Make a Deal? Okay, the, the, how about the, the pre-Wayne Brady let's make a deal? Let's put it that way. The old school let's make a deal. You're given a choice. You're on this game show and you're given a choice. Would you like what's behind door number one? Or would you like what's behind door number two? Now there could be something really good behind that door or it could be something that you really don't want. Like you could, you could choose door number one and there could be a, a vacation package or the new car. Or you could choose door number two, and behind door number two is the, the goat. And, and sorry if there's some of you that love goats, but. <laughs> it could be a bill. <laughs> How about that? Is that better? <laughs> it could be something you don't want, right? Or something that doesn't really have a lot of value. And unfortunately, in our story, the young man is, is caught in this moment of trying to pick the right door. And what happens is him and his parents are coming to the understanding that and this guy cannot be the sinner that you're claiming him to be and make this miracle happen. And so they go look for the shepherd. They're going to go look for the real they're gonna, they, they want the good. They want the right door. They want to choose the right way. And so they leave. And when he finds him, he knows the shepherd. It has to be unlocked a little bit because he's got to tell him who he is. And then it clicks. And then Jesus, chapter 10, Jesus is standing there surrounded by this crowd of witnesses and he lays on this story of the shepherd and the sheep. 
I love it when he gets to verse seven through 10 because it says he has to repeat it because they don't have any idea what he's talking about. <laughs> How many of us need that? Right? I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. He says that twice. That means it's really important. Those who come in through me will be saved. To be awful? No, they will come and go freely and will find good pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. And my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Every day we have a choice to make. From the moment we wake up to the moment we close our eyes for the day, we have moment after moment after moment of choosing whether or not we wanna hear the shepherd's voice and walk through the gate. And oftentimes we don't choose the right gate because the world looks really appealing. Acceptance, oh, diversity, inclusion. You hear in those words? They sound so great. But who's choosing to walk through Jesus' gate? That's what I wanna know because that's the gate that matters. The world's gate is really big and it feels really good, but it's not meant to last forever. I go back to my jelly donut, right? If I eat that jelly donut, oh man, that was so good, but now what? It doesn't last. The feeling it gives you, the, the temporary endorphins, the things it does temporarily to your body and your mind, doesn't last, it's not sustainable. Anybody that's dealt with an addiction to a substance of any kind can tell you it doesn't last. They call it an addiction because you've got to keep getting it to keep feeling it. Jesus' gate doesn't work that way. It's always open. It's always good. And we always don't choose it because it's hard. It's not easy. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Look at what everybody's doing, including leaders of entire denominational people. They're choosing easy. That is not what Jesus is saying. Come through my gate. This is where goodness is. This is where hope is. This is where truth is. Come through this gate. Come on. I was thinking this morning about why I, I chose to dress this way, and it's because I was basically kind of running out of time, <laughs> right? I'm like, oh, I don't really have time to put a tie on. I don't have time to tie the tie. I don't have time to button all the buttons. I don't have time to put the jacket on. Um, so long story short, our dog Jake is diabetic. Now see, unfortunately, that means Jake has two times a day where he gets to eat. And unfortunately, the reason that Jake is diabetic is because he's been able to eat whatever he wants whenever he wants. People food, regular food. It's always just been whenever you eat, you eat. And so when you got a, you know, your pizza crust, yep, there you go, buddy, good job. Right, when you got a couple extra French fries, especially those ones you don't like, right, there you go, buddy, good job. Unfortunately, as I'm sitting there this morning and I'm spending time with him, because it's not easy, because he can, I, I, we're trying to feed him his food, right? Some, some nice fiber and protein content, nothing that's, that's high in sugars, right? Trying to keep his sugars low. And so as I put this food in front of him, he just kind of looks at me like, you're an idiot. <laughs> that is not a jelly donut. <laughs> See, Jake's in a place where he can't choose anymore. He doesn't get to. It's not the way he's made. He doesn't get to make decisions. So his choice is always good to the point of where he's now dying. I mean, he's literally wasting away to nothing because he won't eat because it's not the thing that really tastes good. He doesn't get to choose. He can't make up his own mind. He just knows that that ain't it. 
and I'll die on this hill, that ain't it, right? And as I'm watching him, I'm seeing human beings on a larger scale and we're being misled every day because the next thing is gonna help you lose weight. The next thing's gonna help your life. This person is, is, you know, taking our country in a wrong direction. This person is doing this and this person isn't. And boy, if you aren't just really doing this, then you're doing it wrong. And we're always constantly misled. And we are just like Jake. And we're gonna willingly go wherever the world says to go and we're gonna die in the process because we don't wanna go through the gate that's hard. I was talking, uh, listening to um, a podcast and I came across Jesse Cruikshank. Jesse is a doctor of neurology. In other words, she's really super smart and she knows a lot about the brain and how it works. And I don't know why, maybe it's just where I'm at currently in life, but I follow a lot of smart people who know a lot of smart things, but yet they're really grounded in who Jesus is and who God is. Because they've, they've gone to the pinnacle of research and finding physical truth and only to realize that God made that. And Jesse says that the reason that we are what we are is because God made us in and that includes our brain and the way it works. And so we are wired to, to seek that acceptance. And it's one of the reasons why churches will grow and will find more organic, natural growth when small groups of people gather together and form relationships. Because like the church in, in Acts 2, yeah, like that. Because they rely on each other, they care about each other and there's community and the triune God is a God of community. He's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and he's been there since pre-creation. He knows the importance of relationship. He knows the importance of being together. And as Jesus is trying to talk about this gate, he's talking about it to a larger group of people because the sheep that come through the gate they're gonna need each other. They know, he knows that they're going to need each other and they're going to need to come to a place where they can not worry about the voice of the, the thief and the robber as much as they are about the good shepherd. And when you are together with other people, it makes passing through the right gate a little easier. It makes it more beneficial. I remember we were talking, uh, I was talking in Maplewood and we got to talking about this and I remembered um, going through uh, my life-changing experiences and the things that actually changed my life were a small group that was willing to go and follow Jesus wherever it took them. That everybody within that group of people that got together their lives were never gonna be the same after that. And they still aren't. <laughs> we're still weird. <laughs> but we're following Jesus and we're doing it with a strength that we never knew we had, with the ability to see things that we never thought we could. And I remember having the conversation and as I was driving down 24 just a minute ago, I just started crying. It's just like, man, I miss that. I really miss that, that intimate loving thing where I didn't have to be pastor. <laughs> I could just be with other people that, that I love. And I'm like, I'm sure my wife misses that because now we have to run and go and you got to take your choice. Like, do you got soccer? Because I got a meeting, right? So you got you to break up a lot. And I just think if only we knew, if only we could feel that, what it feels like when you know you've had a long week. I'm looking at some of y'all who are in small, the small groups that I've seen when you've had a long week and you really don't want to, and it's really hard, and you're thinking, oh, I'm just gonna be getting home from work. I haven't done this yet. I haven't even eaten dinner, but small group starting. And when you fight and you push through all the things that the world's trying to tell you and you get there, oh man, it's totally worth it. Spark of your week, it's the hope that you filled with. It just changes everything. That's the gate. 
That's the gate. And we keep choosing the wrong one a lot. Jesus is the gate. He keeps it open. He keeps it open so that those who want to choose it can hear his voice and follow where he's leading. Unfortunately, we tend to be more like the Pharisees at times because we're, we're leaning in a way that feels like we should have a vested interest in thinking about our future, right? Physically, emotionally, right? We should have a vested interest in this. But Jesus is always reminding us that his gate is really kind of narrow, and it's really more about a, a kingdom that we can't see, as he would call it, because it's not here yet. Talk about really being hard to invest in, right? I want, you want me to walk through that gate? I can't even see it. <laughs> like, where are we going to go? I, I truly feel that, it, that we are his sheep, and, and we know the sound of his voice. The problem that we have is whether we choose to follow it and choose to hear it. One of the things that uh, Jesse Crookshank said this way was, uh, we come to a point of salvation in our life and we accept this, we see this. Jesus saved us. He gives us new birth. He creates in us this, this salvation moment. Why would God leave us here? Why wouldn't we come to salvation and go whoop, right up to heaven? Right? Again, he's the God of the triune relationship. He wants you to experience that salvation and experience going through the gate so that you can start talking to other people and having relationships and bringing those people through the gate because that is who God is. That's who he is. Which gate are you going to choose? You're going to be thinking about that hopefully all week this week. You're going to wake up tomorrow morning and go, oh, what gate. Oh, I don't want to go. Oh, I don't even know where my boots are. Oh, I need gas in my car. What gate? What gate are you choosing? What gate are you walking through? Are there things that you have to do? Sure. We all have responsibilities as human beings. But what gate are we walking through to make it happen? How can your attitude show others who Jesus is when you walk through the gate? Because a lot of times what the world is seeing in us is not a person that's walked through the right gate. Let's show them what gate we're walking through. If we are his sheep, we're going to follow where he leads. And it's going to be good because he said so. <laughs> Amen. Join me as we pray over our offering this morning. Gracious and loving God, you have provided for us in the midst of turmoil, and yet you always provide for us out of abundance, not out of scarcity. There's always enough when it comes to you. God, you have promised us that we will take a last breath from the moment we breathed our first. You guaranteed we're going to take a last one, and everything in between that is a life lived here on earth, but it is not all of it. It's temporary. Everything you keep giving us is a blessing upon a blessing upon a blessing. And we are called by you to respond to your word and give it back. That's the offering part. We are offering ourselves, our money, our time, our energy, our talents, and our gifts back to you so that you can multiply this, this kingdom here on earth. People will want to follow us through the gate and they will hear your voice. That's what offering is. We pray that you would take this offering of ours, you would multiply it, make it grow as you see fit, allow it to be everything you need it to be for the glory of your kingdom. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus, for if through him all of this is possible. And with the grace and help and guidance of your Holy Spirit that is here right now in our midst. Amen. If you're able to stand and join me in our closing hymn, we're gonna sing, He Leadeth Me. Hopefully he is right through the gate, right?
And so I want to share with you a story. You got something? Last evening, we traveled over to Rushi. Um, it was mix prom night. Um, that's Leslie's youngest son. And while we were coming into Rushi, there is a big Catholic church, St. Remy, and we saw all of these high school kids dressed in their formals, tuxedos, pouring into that church for a mass. And I thought, how special is that? That those kids had the desire to attend that mass. So I'm asking you, our Riverside prom is next Saturday. And um, there's a lot of us that have kids, grandkids, uh, children that are going to be involved in that. And just pray mm -hmm. that they make the right choices and safety will prevail. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Amen. Choices. I want to leave you with some words. I know it's, it's not quite that time of year, but you'll get it once you hear it. Uh, in a sermon by James Merritt, he made this relationship to choosing the right door. 14,000 people were inside the Twin Towers. 12,000 were able to escape, but 2,749 were not. Here is one of the most fascinating and also gripping parts of the story. It is the account of how some people lived and some people died depending upon one decision they made. Which door do you take? To give you an example, just one situation, one group of people in an office trying to flee after the plane hit the tower had to make a decision. Most of the people in that group decided to take the door that led to an elevator. The rest of the group decided to take the door that led to the stairwell. The group that took the elevator died. The group that took the stairwell lived. It is a physical picture of a virtual reality about life, and that is life really is about taking the right door. Unfortunately, it's really appealing sometimes the door that the world wants to give you to take. It's easy. It would have been easy to take the elevator, right? The stairs, maybe not so easy. But sometimes that's where God is asking you to go. What gate are we going to choose this week? Join me in our closing doxology. Praise God.